And then when you get up here, there's an even greater effort to play, and especially play at a high level. So I always say the elements, I think the conditioning that it takes, uh, the, the input and everything that it takes from a guy that wants to really play well. I think up here that this is the Mount Everest of street ball because it's 94 by 50, it's a lot of heat and humidity, it's great fans, and then there's the challenge of the 12 minute quarters which makes it kind of NBA like and I just think that the, the tradition of the people that played up here from Strick to Satterfield to, to Jordan Ammon to the people we have today, to Mason, it, it, it brings out the best in people. So I just came up with that name and you guys thankfully stuck with it and I'm always seeing this as the toughest test in pro-am basketball. Uncle G Stacks, Beach Chronicles, Hoops in the Sun, Season 2, Episode 1. Here we go. Just being a street ball fan all my life. Uh, growing up in that environment in Harlem. Uh, having been down there since I was a child. Having played for some of the institutions down there from Riverside to Church of the Masters. Phipps PAL, God bless Leroy Otis. And I got turned out down there and I loved it. And I went to Kingdome. I, I heard early Gumby. You probably got to be a little older to know about that, but Gumby was a big inspiration for us, for people that followed street ball. And then Rucker Park, of course, it was a time where they were the only things jumping. And I just, I would always go back to my neighborhood and describe what I saw. That was just me as a kid. I would always come back, tell the people on my block and my hood, you should have seen Future, you should have seen Master Rob, you should have seen this and that. And it just became commonplace for me to always relay what I saw to my community. And the guys would always crowd around and they would always listen and they would say, yeah, you know, it was kind of exciting. And for some reason or another, I just kept doing it, doing it, and then I, coming off of a prison stretch, I was able to hear Brawley. And shout out to Brawley, Brawley Chisholm from Pro City. And it was just inspiring, you know, Commissioner Ken, co-CEO, co-COO, excuse me, kind of, you know, he just forced me down. He didn't push me, but he made it his business to show me that life. And after hearing Brawley and seeing the excitement and the joy that he brought people and the way people crowded around the announcer when the game was over, I said, hey, maybe that's something that I could look into. And sure enough, I just kept coming around the community, talking these things, and I did it in front of Kendrick, and Kendrick having this relationship with Joe and Randy, he was able to actually get me a tryout, which I never really, really anticipated. I never really thought that it would come to a point where I would actually have a mic, but I always had an invisible one, that type. So finally, we're doing it one night in my community, and Ken got tired of it, and he, he just got tired of hearing about it, and uh, he told me, you know what, I'm taking you up there and get you a tryout. And I was right there, the moment is still like yesterday, of him calling Joe and Randy saying, hey, I'm bringing my uncle up there tomorrow, and I want to see what he could do. The funny, funny story is that when I got up here, you know, you can, how they say, you can envision anything, but actually doing it and, and getting it done was a whole different thing. When I actually got up here, I was scared shitless. This is a big park. It's a, it's a, it was a great environment. We going back to 07, and still a lot of legendary guys around. And Joe really gave me the opportunity, and I was dumbfounded. I really didn't know anything about it as much as I thought I knew. As much as I thought I knew about this sport, this culture, when they gave me the mic, I didn't know anything. I didn't know any players. I didn't know any teams. I didn't know how to play time out. I didn't know how to talk about the sponsorships, about what we represented as a league. And it, it was just a tough time for somebody that always, always runs their mouth, somebody that really thought they knew everything. And give Joe and Randy credit, they stuck with it. They heard little things. They were little things that I think they heard that said, hey, get a guy a chance. Of course, with Kendrick, they didn't just want to give me the boot. And slowly but surely, thanks to Bobby C, a guy that we'll go into later, a guy that inspired me kind of like no other, because when I first heard him, I couldn't believe it. I had never heard, not only that he was a white boy, I just had never heard anybody that good do something up here at Orchard. I just couldn't believe it. And it was inspiring. 
And I told my nephew at the time, uh, rest his soul, I said, you know, that white boy is nice. My favorite nephew, Bobby C, what they call in the game, my turnout, right? And Bobby, to me, the most gracious of a host, you know, because the guy just, he stepped aside, he, he let me learn, he taught me. He didn't, I'm not going to say force anything on me, but he led me. And it was great. So when I finally get on, right, and I finally got my groove now, and everybody's Uncle G-Stacks, this and that, one of the first things Bobby did, he said, man, meet me at Lehman College, you know. I'm like, oh man, here this white boy go with this bullshit. And I go up there early in the morning, studio time, and he gets me on Bronxnet, channel 67. Shout out to Bobby in the whole Bronxnet. So one of the first things he did when he got me up, he said, gee, talk about yourself. Tell people what you, I said, I'm your partner, this, that, and the third. Then he has the nerve to take a ESPN mic, a mic from TNT that they had in the studio, and called out all the executive producers. You're missing one. You need the uncle. So the role of an MC, of an announcer, at a pro-am, it's, it's transitioned over the years. It's a little different normally. You know, I think when I first got here with Bobby, it was color and it was the play-by-play. -play. And I think that that's still the basis for pro-am. But over the years, you see it in a lot of these tournaments that there's one guy doing everything. And I think that changes the burden. I know for me, and because these fans are so intelligent and because they understand the game and they travel and they go through a lot to get here, I feel a different obligation. You know, I feel like we're talking to people that know this game. We're talking to tradition. And I think the role of an announcer is to have everybody on the same page. You're kind of calling something and describing what people already see. You know, people already see the good handle. People already see, and I think everybody at some point is a commentator, especially if they like sports. You see it in the NBA, you see it in the NFL, where people say, hey, that was a third down, why didn't you run it? Or, you know, why didn't you shoot the three? And I think as a commentator, you're thinking for, you're speaking for the sports fan. You're saying, and, and you're doing it in your delivery, with, with your mindset, and what you captured, but you're speaking for the whole park. You're letting people know it's almost like you're narrating a movie because they're watching something unfold, and here you are, the announcer, and you're making it clear and plain for everybody that's watching. So there's a lot of burden in that. There's a lot of responsibility in that, especially at a pro-am where the players are reaching for bigger goals, reaching to go overseas, reaching to play NBA, D1 college guys, used to real commentators. So I think the role of an announcer today, in today's age, is more about getting people to see the same thing. There's more to the beast than just going up there to catch a game. It's family friendly. I don't know how Pop even thought of it. But it was magical and it was genius because it, it became traditional. It's traditional to come up here and enjoy a good game and bring your family, have some food, parking. It's just a whole conglomerate of things that go into dealing with hoops in the summer. But it starts with a great beach, a great site. You know, I always talk about it. You hear my commentary, sexiest site in town. The women make it crazy, the bathing suits, the bikers, the skateboarders. There's just so many elements that make us who we are. And the thing that I preach more than anything is we're so family friendly. When you get an NBA guy in the building, you know you got to stream everything right. When I talk about the vocabulary, I'm talking about the intent, I'm talking about connecting with the fan, and then motivating an NBA player, which I've been able to do. I think I was good at it with Lance. I think I did great with Kimba, with Ron Artest, Marcus Williams, John Lucas III, Joe Kimno. You can go on down the line. But for me, it was always a call to arms. Anytime that you guys told me, hey, we got so-and-so in here today, I knew that I had to go another level in commentary. I had to know background about the NBA guy. I had to alert the fans that an NBA guy is here. And then I had to kind of let the, the crowd see that the NBA player really came out here to play. You know, he didn't come out here just because of his name. He came out here because he loves the sport. 
He loves the beach and he wants to be successful. So I think for any announcer across the landscape, when you get a pro in the building, it's elevated going up. And that's pretty much what it was for me. Still is to this day. Kimba, who's my homie, all the way from, I'm talking about Yukon all the way up. And he came out here, and they always tell the announcer, Stax, I got you. You know, this is just something that pros do. I got you. I'm like, you got something from? They got you. And Kimba came out here, and you would have thought he was still trying out for his high school team. I mean, Jersey sweaty, energy off the chains, really challenged himself out here, Ron Artest. Diving, I can never forget, diving into the stands, diving into his own bench after having a world championship. And it just shows you what it means to them. Marcus Williams, when he was with the Nets, came out here courtesy of my boy Sat, showed everything that I thought he could do in a pro-am. John Lucas III, who I recruited myself, who came out here after playing with Big Apple Circus down there at Hunter College and came up here and said, Stax, thank you. I love it. I love the energy. I love the back and forth. People don't care if I'm a pro. And he killed it. Gary Forbes killed it. And then you got to understand, I was always really, really close to a pro and my favorite player, Kenny Zadifin. So I was already warmed up to what it would take to impress a pro and engage him on the mic by having Dre Barry and Kenny and Ray Rivera and them up here consistently. Homicide, these are guys that were already around the pro game or in it. So then when you bring the actual NBA guys in and they kill, it just proves my point that Mount Everest is the place to be when there's a good game going on. And shout to all the NBA players that came out and performed and showed the kids there's nothing wrong with coming back once you make it. And I think if you look at the last 24 years and what this has meant to the Bronx community, you know, I was talking to Ruben Diaz, our old Bronx Barrel president, and one of the things he was saying is that so many people want to partake in this. So many people don't know it's here. I speak about it all the time, being a hidden jewel. But when you talk about impact, and you talk about lives being saved, and you talk about deterrence, and you talk about kids with opportunity to dream, and I, all, I call them all dream chasers, I don't think you can beat Orchard Beach. It's a family, and, and we're never knocking any other venue, but this is a family-friendly site. It's easy on the kids, it's laid back. It's not the same energy that you get in some of the hood communities, but it is the same energy. You know, it's the same fight to be good. It's the same battle to reign supreme. You know, it's the same energy and edge. And I look at it from my time here, from the decade and a half plus that I've been here, I don't know what I would have did without Orchard Beach, without Hoops in the Sun. So I can only imagine you know, I can only imagine what it's meant to some parents, some kids that were in the middle of going the wrong way, and then they have this. So I just think, and not only for Pop and Randy and Joe and Ken and our staff, I just think that they need more. I think at this point here in 2024, it is a must that we expand. Joe and them can only do so much. So we kind of, you know, we do as much as we can to offset everything around these kids that we serve, but it just needs to be so much more. And I think that's why hits is really, really so important because it doesn't just serve as entertainment. It doesn't just serve as somewhere where you can come see your favorite guy, maybe on TV or maybe at college, but it's somewhere where your nephew, your grandkid, you know how many people I've run into? I'm an OG. You know how many people I've run into? Stacks, what you doing up here? And I'm saying, I'm up here serving the kid, and they're like, yo, that's beautiful, man. My nephew is playing, my grandson is playing. So it's a community inside a community, and I think what we're doing up here and what it means to the Bronx, it's, it's, it's unparalleled. You just can't really put in the words how many lives we've impacted and changed and put on the right course by putting that MVP in the kid's hand or a kid that was ready to smoke weed or run and be in a gang and say, yo, I got a game this Saturday. I don't want to be around that. So the purpose of Hoops in the Sun, it's, it's inexplicable. But, but it really, really has changed a lot of lives. Definitely changed my life, so I can only imagine what it's done for the kids. I'm excited. I mean, show them, really. Like, you know, let them see.
we're up here on a day where there's no games. We're just prepping. We're getting some camera work. But this feeling, these honeys, this sunbathing, just the people out enjoying the weather, getting ready for Memorial Day, man, it's magical. And again, I'm every time that Joe and Randy and Ken give me this opportunity, it takes me back to 2007. It takes me back to the very first time I walked in this park and didn't even know what I was doing. So the excitement, the build up, you know, the referees on time or not on time, the late shows, running the clock, just so many intricate things that happen during the course of a season, but you can't wait, it goes so quick. You know, that I've learned in my time up here, I've learned to enjoy all of it. The forfeits, the downtime, the arguments, the back and forth with the refs, you know, searching for water, watering these guys, these guys, damn, excuse me, it's a, it's a magical time for the city. And what's more important for me is seeing the lives we save, the kids we keep out of trouble, the parents that shortchange their summer to support these kids in their dreams, man. It's magical. June 15th, you're not going to believe what we're doing, but who's in the sun in the 24th year going right for the juggler? We're going to kill him.